a Living History production. I'm Matt McLaughlin. And I'm Pete Smith. We're battlefield historians who love nothing better than getting out and walking the ground where great battles in history took place. And now we'd like you to come with us. Every week, Battle Walks will take you to one of the great battlefields of Europe. As we walk the ground, we'll dig through the pages of history, we'll uncover the secrets of the battlefields, and most importantly, we'll tell the stories of the people who fought and died there. Welcome to Battle Walks. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us once again as we walk the great battlefields of Europe on Battle Walks. I'm excited about this one, we're heading back to Europe, heading back to Belgium in fact, which we haven't done for a little while, and we're doing World War II. We always get a great response to the World War II episodes that we do. We focus a lot on World War I because it's a passion of both Pete's and mine, but we always get a lot of great responses when we do World War II, and we love doing World War II battlefields. So hopefully many more of these coming up. This one, we're doing the Battle of the Bulge. We're doing the area around Bastogne in Belgium. It's going to be a really a great one. And joining me, as always, to walk this battlefield is the one and only Pete Smith. Pete, welcome back. Hi, Matt. Yep, nice to be back with you. Looking forward to this one, mate. I have to say I'm going to do a full disclosure now to everyone listening that I have not actually walked to this battlefield in reality. So many times I've been supposed to go to Bastogne and to the area around the Battle of the Bulge to explore it. Uh, during tours of Europe, and I've, I've never made it there for whatever reason. I will say at the outset, that's probably because it's not necessarily that easy to get to. This is in an odd little corner of Belgium. You don't generally travel there um, on your way to and from anywhere. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Um, it is, Matt. Yeah, it's up, it's up in the corner that I suppose, where would you be going? It's one of the routes you could get into Germany from there, but it wouldn't be a natural route, really. So, no, it's, uh, it's, it's just tucked up uh, in the corner. It's where Luxembourg, I suppose, that's where you'd be going because it's right beside Luxembourg. In, in fact, it's, it's part of, um, of the Ardennes uh, region. Luxembourg, Germany, Belgium all have an area of the Ardennes. It covers a mainly wooded area, very uh, mountainous, hilly. And, um, yeah, so it's it's a junction. Belgium, Holland's not even that far away. Uh, so it's it's right on the uh, border of Germany. And that's the interesting point, I suppose, for what we're going to be talking about today. Now, this was really the Germans' last roll of the dice in the West during the Second World War. This was Hitler's last gamble to try and, you know, ridiculously to try and defeat the, the Western allies uh, on the Western Front during the uh, during the Second World War, and so it took place uh, in uh, the, at, right at the very end of 1944, stretching into the early part of 45. A very costly battle for both the Germans and the Allies involved. Pete, why don't you give us one of your excellent two minute potted histories of the Battle of the Bulge, so we know why this area is so important. Okay, so first of all, the battle to the date when it started, 16th of December, um, it's an attempt by the Germans to to break through and to split basically the British from the Americans and to drive a wedge all the way to Antwerp if possible. Now, whose battle is this? Who initiated it? Uh, who planned it? Well, it, it's absolutely Hitler. So it's none of his his generals. It is it is completely planned by him. In fact, most of his generals were totally against it in one way or another for various reasons. Um what is it going to do? Well, it's going to use up the, the last of the German army, really, in the in this push. Would it have won them the war? No, it, no, it wouldn't. It definitely would not have won them the war. But what it could have done, it, it, it's so similar to the Germans' last roll of the dice in 1918. That, if the Germans had broken through in 1918, would that, which they did, but did they get to the coast? Not quite. But would that have, have won them the war? Would they have uh, succeeded uh, in 1918 in, in eventually uh, uh, beating the uh, uh, the, the the allies effectively no no they wouldn't and it's the same at this point but what they're hoping is that there will be a treaty that there'll be a pa- a pause there will be some kind of of the war will stop and the and the Germans will be in a better position to to not exactly dictate terms but but have their say about what should happen next can we just touch on that point Pete because I think that's a fascinating aspect of the history and the, the incredible misread by Hitler and the German commanders about what was going on that uh, that ideal the the that objective to try and improve your position in upcoming peace negotiations made some sense during the first world war that in 1918 when everyone was exhausted when germany had made a very good account of itself and you know had captured large parts of france and belgium and was you know you know at the time of that fighting in a relatively strong position obviously they were going to lose the war but they were in a real you know an okay position that made some sense if they took large chunks of the land, if they split armies and, and, and were in a dominant position, that it could have forced a very war-weary 
allied populace to to give them better terms in a peace negotiation. That made sense during the First World War. It absolutely did not make any sense in the Second World War, mostly because the Allies had learnt their lesson from the first time around, that they were not, and especially with Hitler, with the Holocaust, with all of the evil aspects of the Nazi empire, there was no way that the war was going to end with anything un- other than the complete destruction of that German machine. So it wasn't, it wasn't a particularly good plan in the First World War, and it was a, a disastrously impossible plan in the Second World War. Yeah, indeed. And at this point, uh, General Guderian um, really wanted to use the, the last of the uh, of, of the Wehrmacht, the last of the of the forces that were actually that you could still use, that were still uh, cohesive, in in holding the gem, the uh, sorry, holding the Russians back a little longer. Uh, and that was the worry. The the Russians were slowly getting nearer and nearer to Berlin, and and that's where he felt that the effort should should be made. Um, I think the the other generals really just thought that the whole plan was too ambitious. But nobody's going to go up against Hitler. This was what he what he wanted, um, and you have to say, and this is what we're going to be talking about. It starts very well, uh, partly because of again, it, I find this extraordinary. Really, partly because they came through the Ardennes again, and we were not ready. Well, you have to go back to 1940. We weren't ready in 1940 when they came through the Ardennes. Uh, so it's again, it's a, it's a surprise, but that's what they're going to do. They're going to uh, come through the Ardennes, and Bastogne is right in their way. So this is why we're going to be here studying uh, what we can see. And this, again, is not going to be the whole story of, of the battle. It's not going to be the whole story of what went on in the area. We're going to be having a walk around the town of Bastogne and, and having a look at what we can actually see, because it is crucial. It was uh, At the time, it was an absolute crucial location. So tell us, tell us just what the Germans did in this attempt to break through and, and why it's known as the Battle of the Bulge. Right. Well, the Battle of the Bulge is is our name uh, for it. Um, in fact, the uh, the Germans called it the the Arden Offensive, and I think well, most most people actually called it the Arden Offensive. It's probably an American term, knowing the Americans, the Battle of the Bulge, and it's it's this bulge that is going to be created. And if you and this is a great one for having a look at the maps. If you have a look at the maps, and you can see exactly what they're aiming to do, and they're aiming to to get to uh, to Antwerp. And of course, Antwerp is the major port. It's the nearest ma- major major port. And so what we're going to get is, again, it's tanks. This is this is really a tank battle to start off with German tanks uh, bursting through. And in Bastogne particularly, now this has a, a, a very popularist, uh, I suppose, story that goes with it. And it's about the, the 101st Airborne, an easy company. For anybody that's watched any of the TV uh, series, uh, The Band of Brothers, then they will know that they were in Bastogne. And uh, and that's really why it's always been a pop- an interesting, popular, not really a, a good, an interesting place to go to. If you're on a battlefield tour, then then yes, uh, of the Second World War and the fighting in that area, then you would, uh, you would go to probably end up in Bastogne. Well, without a shadow of doubt, because as you'll see from some of the memorials, there are some very important memorials here in Bastogne. Um, so it's it's the 101st Airborne that gets stuck here, and it's them facing uh, the German uh, Panzers. Uh, as we'll get, uh, as we slowly walk around the town, we'll get more of the story by some of the memorials that uh, represents uh, what was going on in the area. I think it's fascinating that one of the aspects that uh, is most interesting about this battle is the reason that the Ardennes Forest, in particular, was not as heavily defended as it should have been by the Allies is their assessment that it was a terrible place for tanks to operate the, in the, 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 the tightly wooded area, the narrow roads, the muddy ground, the snow. It was winter, obviously, that it was a terrible place for tanks to operate. So they didn't, uh, they probably didn't defend it as well as they should have. And it's funny, it's funny how in history and in warfare, these things have a way of working themselves out that even though they were unprepared for the start of the battle, that assessment was eventually proven quite correct that this was a terrible environment for tanks to operate. And that was one of the big things that held the Germans up. The weather was a factor as well. But the the fact that these were narrow wooded areas with narrow little roads and snow and mud, um, it did prove to be a disastrous place for uh, for tanks to, uh, to to try and operate in. It's also, there's another issue, and that's because we have rivers here. The Meuse River is, is not that far away. And of course, it also means you've got to seize the bridges. Because you know, if you're going to head to the coast, then if you don't seize the bridges and you've got tanks, then that's that's the end of it straight away, and and that wasn't really achieved, and so it, it comes to a grinding halt very very quickly. It's really just totally based upon this element of surprise, and and it was a surprise, you have to say. So basically, the Germans launched this big attack. They succeeded in pushing the Americans back. The this bulge was formed in a line, and and several groups were rushed in to try and plug the gaps, including as you mentioned, Easy Company and the 101st Airborne. Um, and basically it became almost a siege, didn't it? Particularly around Bastogne, the, the, the Americans were quite besieged there for a while. 
the also the uh, the other thing that's quite interesting is, and uh, this has been used in warfare on on as I suspect on by the Germans quite uh, quite often, but here it was it was maximised, and that was American uh, German soldiers dressed in American uniforms, um, and they were ahead of the advance, causing confusion. So so it was something that was really planned very carefully. Whereas it's a bit ad hoc, putting on an enemy's uniform is always dangerous. You're going to be classed as a spy, but the the Germans had really uh, gone to uh, gone to some level to make sure that the uh, the German soldiers could speak very good Amer- uh, American with a very good uh, American accent, uh, English with an American accent, and and set them ahead at crossroads and misdirecting reinforcements moving up and uh, clever and that's I suppose it is it's a clever a clever battle it had the potential but but it, it it really from day one was not going to going to succeed. The only thing that gave the Germans a good advantage at the start as well was the fact that the weather was so poor that the completely dominant allied air power could not operate in a way that uh, that they potentially wanted to but as soon as that weather cleared a few days into the battle terrible scenes of german tanks getting blasted uh, from the ground by uh, by air power that was always going to be the case particularly in the fighting in the west yeah yeah ab- absolutely um and i think the the cold helped them in some ways as, as well because american soldiers in this area were not expecting to they were they were just kind of on the border of germany preparing for a, an ongoing advance but this is not where the big push was going to take place into germany so they're just really holding the line and they were not particularly well equipped uh, for this winter weather and so that also is going to cause them a problem well, let's begin the walk, Peaks. It's a fascinating area, and uh, as I said, I'm really looking forward to this one because I haven't done it on the ground. I, I certainly will as soon as I get back over to Europe. But I'm looking forward to this virtual exploration of, of the Battle of the Bulge and particularly the sites in and around Bastogne. So where are we going to begin? Okay, so we're going to start in the uh, the main square, which is called uh, McAuliffe Square. And he's the commander of the 101st, the, uh, the Airborne, who are trapped here. And it was renamed in 1947 in his honour, so that's where we start. The one thing I would say here, before you come here, have a look uh, online and see if you can find any photographs of the town taken during uh, this period, because the then and now aspects uh, makes it very interesting. Um, obviously, uh, as Matt uh, suggested, we spend a lot of time on the First World War battlefields and I had nothing better than standing in a place and then imagining what it looked like uh, uh, during the war. But here, you don't have to imagine, really, because there's an awful lot of the buildings are the same buildings. Um, you can even see the damage on them, bullet hits, uh, bits that have been rebuilt. And so you can you can have some good fun holding a, a series of photographs and walking around the town and saying, oh, that's that building and that was used as a headquarters or whatever. So um, always worthwhile having a look at it. And in fact, I stayed in a hotel on one of my tours here I stayed in a hotel in the square and uh, I remember getting the uh, a photograph out because I'd already pre-prepared and looking out of my window looking across the square and uh, a picture taken in 1944 during the uh, during the, the fighting here and it was the view from my uh, from my bedroom window so it, it really gives you that real feel of uh, of being there just extraordinary yeah it is it is it's uh, and that and that is very different to the first world battlefields everything's been rebuilt so nothing looks exactly as it had done but uh, here uh, yeah it's uh, yeah it's it, it gives you a, a nice uh, yeah a nice feeling of not quite being there but you feel more attached to the people that were there when you can actually see the locations Right in the square, and I have to say there are a lot of these, there were an awful lot of tanks in this area, and so tanks become part of the memorialisation of the fighting around here. And there's a, a Sherman tank in the middle of the of the town, in the middle of the square, uh, from the 11th uh, Armoured Division, known as the Thunderbolt Division. It's on a plinth, and it uh, it was actually knocked out on the 30th of December 1944, so right at the, at the right period, and inaugurated there in 1947. So that's just worthwhile to go and have a look at a Sherman from the time that was actually there and, uh, and fought in the battle. And there are a lot of these about. There's a lot of turrets. You'll find that every route into Bastogne has a turret embedded in a plinth on the at the side of the road. So you'll find a lot, as we'll see as we're, we're going on this walk. So that's the first thing to go and uh, have a look at. Around the bottom of it, you'll get uh, plinth to other uh, units. So there is one to the 10th uh, Armoured Division. There's a plaque to the 406 Fighter Group. Um, and they were very successful once the weather lifted, as Matt just mentioned, so there's a plaque to them. And then right beside it, there's a Liberty Road marker. Now, these are fantastic. The Liberty Road was effectively 
the American advance into Germany. So they go right the way from the Normandy beaches, from Juno Beach. There's one right on the uh, on, on the there's a, a museum there. Right beside it, there's a, a one of the Liberty markers, and every kilometre there's a marker all the way to here to Bastogne. So this is where we have the last few markers are around the town here, and there's one of one of those. And it's basically it's a white. Uh, how would I describe it? It's a, a white. Um, it's not obelisk because it's rounded, so it's a smooth, round little memorial that would sit beside a road, and on it there's the part of the Statue of Liberty. It's the the flaming torch, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's just. Uh, extraordinary if you're driving on the roads and you see these in any direction following the the, the route and you see these liberty markers uh, i think it was a, a great idea i was just quickly trying to look at my notes and see when uh, when these were when these were actually put in 1946 Correct. according to your notes oh yes thank you you're quicker at reading my own notes so 1946 uh, uh, correct um and it's uh, 1145 kilometers the whole length of it or 712 mi- miles and every kilometer there's one of these so yeah i think it was a- so there's one 1,145 markers between the Normandy landing beaches and Germany. Correct. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, it is. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so. I've seen I've seen the ones in Normandy. Obviously, that's uh, that's uh, as far on that route as I've advanced. But um, yeah, they they are quite spectacular. And um, it was a French initiative, wasn't it? It wasn't the Americans that determined. Yeah, it was, to do it. It was it a was French initiative French. in honor of the Americans. It was indeed. Yeah, and in fact, the very first one was um, placed at uh, just outside the Paris uh, uh, Saint Symphorien, uh, which uh, is very much central so that's where the first one and then they then they started left and right presumably uh, yeah so i think it's, it's great when you see them they've, they've all been kept very well so it's it's good to see them fantastic what else is there to see in the square right, in the square one more thing and that's the uh, mcauliffe memorial uh, it's a bronze bust commemorating uh, the general um, who commanded the 101st airborne and it was uh, sculptured uh, by uh, the sister of the Belgian ambassador to the United States at the time and inaugurated by the general himself in 1950. Now, that's interesting. It shows that this place was seen as important. To the 101st Airborne, it was seen as an important place, a place to commemorate their fighting here because they were the people that really held the town. There were other people trapped in the town with them, but they were the guys that, that held on to it. Let's talk about McAuliffe at this point. Point and his fame, the, the thing he's most famous for during the siege of Bastogne. Let's, let's talk about his response to the German commander because it is brilliant and one of the great tales of the Second World War. Yeah, it is. Um, basically, when they were cut off, they were they were they were surrounded, and um, the siege was from the twentieth till the twenty seventh of December. So it's not long, seven seven days, but it was it could have been a lot longer, uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it was it was tough for the guys that were in there not knowing what was going to happen. They tried to air drop supplies to them, so it was tough. Um, so on the uh, on the twenty second, the uh, German commander uh, von Lutwitz uh, in the area dispatched a, a party to basically under a white flag to walk into the town and to ask for the American surrender. And the Americans had, you know, they had no no thought of surrender at this point, uh, so they let them through. And uh, the uh, McAuliffe then, uh, uh, his staff were told that they were outside, and they were told that they needed to respond. And his reaction was just oh, nuts, um, and he just meant he didn't know what to say really. Oh, nuts! I've got to make a decision on what to say. Um, well, one of his lieutenant colonels, a chap called Harry Kennard. Uh, suggested that actually, rather than trying to think of anything else to say, why not use that? Just say nuts to them, and you have to say no wonder the Je- the German officer was bewildered. He didn't he didn't know what it meant, so he had to ask, what does it actually mean? And he said, well, it means go to hell, uh, effectively. Now. He didn't say that, um, as in McAuliffe didn't say that, because that's the whole point. Why he said nuts was he didn't swear. He was uh, quite a religious chap, didn't didn't uh, but didn't believe in swearing, and uh, so so that that's how it ends up just being nuts rather than, than anything else. So it was explained to the German, and off he went, and uh, uh, and off it went into history. To put it into context, I might read out what the German emissary delivered to the Americans because that's that's what I love most about it is the, the formality of the Germans, you know, de- demanding this surrender and then the American reply. So this is what the Germans wrote uh, to the Americans when they sent in that envoy. To the USA commander of the encircled town of Bastogne, the fortune of war is changing. This time the USA forces in and near Bastogne have been encircled by strong German armoured units. More German armoured units have crossed the River Orr near Orthoville, have taken Marsh, 
and reach St. Hubert by passing through Hompre Sibir Tillet. Libremont is in German hands. There is only one possibility to save the encircled USA troops from total annihilation. That is the honourable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over, a term of two hours will be granted, beginning with the presentation of this note. If this proposal should be rejected, one German artillery corps and six heavy AA battalions are ready to annihilate the USA troops in and near Bastogne. The order for firing will be given immediately after this two-hour term. All the serious civilian losses caused by this artillery fire would not correspond with the well-known American humanity. The German commander. And so that I just love that it's just so Germanic. This the officiousness, the arrogance, the formality of the note. Delivered in excellent English, you must say. And that in response, what the Germans receive is, to the German commander, nuts. nuts. The American commander. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's what great. a great story. It's one of those that seems apocryphal. It seems like that can't possibly have happened. If a, if a Hollywood script writer wrote it, you'd, you'd think it was too much of an exaggeration. You would indeed. But, um, that's the reality. And well, well chosen words because they went on to uh, absolutely kick the Germans' butts in, that, in, the, in the coming battle. So just what a great little chapter of the story. I think it's interesting as well. It's bluff and bluster from the Germans because when they uh, received these notes, did the, uh, the town then get plastered by, uh, by hundreds of guns firing at them? No, nothing happened whatsoever. So it was bluff and bluster as well. The Germans didn't have all the, uh, all of the guns. And in fact, the only reason the town came under heavy bombardment is from when the weather changed it did allow some German bombers to get in not that that many were flying as we said because of our air superiority but it was bombed during uh, during the siege and that's really the, the, the next story really we're going to leave the square and we're going to head down a, a little road called Rue de Neuf Chateau uh, and to number 21 and there we'll find a, a plaque on the side of the building now this is to uh, a nurse called Rennie uh, Le Maire um, and she is depicted in that Band of Brothers TV series, uh, not not accurately because uh, she was killed actually when she was uh, looking after some wounded, and it's depicted that she was in the church and she wasn't. It was this house that we're standing in front of uh, is where she was actually uh, went, went, uh, uh, looking after uh, thirty Americans. She had thirty Americans under her care, all of whom were killed, and she was killed as well. I've uh, tried to do a little bit of reading about her and also her death, and again, conflicting stories. Uh, uh, it's sometimes you just cannot put your finger on exactly what happened. Some rather horrific stories that she was uh, found uh, very badly mutilated by the bomb. Others that she uh, came out of the building and went back in to try and rescue the wounded and was was killed when the, the building uh, collapsed. I, I tend to believe the, uh, the former, actually, that I think she was killed when the bomb landed straight off, and I think it's just been a little exaggerated over, over the years. But no matter what, uh, she didn't need to be there. She wasn't even nursing in this area. She w- had been nursing in Brussels and she was home to see her parents and got caught up in the fighting. And of course, you have to remember that at that time, she can go and see her parents now. Uh, uh, people can start moving about. The Germans have been have been forced out the area because it was the 10th of September 1944 that the uh, this town had been retaken. So you have to think what that meant to the townspeople. At last, they, they felt that they were free and then to suddenly find themselves surrounded... Even worse for some of the villages that the Germans did occupy. And this is a little story that I found very, uh, I suppose, uh, disconcerting. That's not quite the right word, but uncomfortable with it. Uh, I've never lived uh, under an occupation of a, an occupying force. and Very few people that listen to these podcasts will, will have been. But I think it was, uh, I think it must have been a very difficult time. If you imagine that you're in a village and you've been occupied for a, a length of time by the Germans, what do you do with your families? How do you react to that? Some people decided to accept the Germans and uh, sometimes not be, uh, I suppose, be friendly to the, towards them. Other people were in the resistance. Well, so one of the sad things that happened, when the Germans were forced back, the people that had been in the resistance let themselves be known because the Germans had been forced back. That's the end. But when the Germans came back and overran these villages again, some of those that had been supporting the Germans then said as the Germans came back, oh, you know so-and-so over there, they were in the resistance. They've been, they've been spouting off their mouths and saying, oh, we were in the resistance and we didn't tell anybody. Well, the Germans came back and they were informed of, of these details and those people were rounded up and executed. So there were some hor- horrible aspects of this, this Germans reoccupying an area that they'd been forced out of. Anyway, back to uh, uh, Renee. She was uh, tending to the wounded, uh, killed. There's now a memorial plaque uh, uh, on the uh, on the building commemorating her, her service. Uh, and there's been a drive to go further than that because the Americans didn't ever 
uh, give her any kind of award for the service. Uh, but we do find that the hair headstone, she's buried in the local uh, communal cemetery. You can, uh, it's a little at the other side of the town, but I've, I've been to go and have a look at her grave. And it was paid for by the US Army Nursing Corps, uh, paid for her, her headstone on her grave. Um, but it's uh, just one of those, one of those very sad little stories uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time, you'd have to say, but doing the best to help the people that are freeing her country, the Americans that are freeing her country and, and killed uh, in doing that. Just a few interesting aspects to that story, Pete, that I think are fascinating as you were giving that excellent account. The the story about how she died, it, it just struck me that the importance of propaganda in wartime, that both of those stories, whether she was killed in the initial bomb blast and horribly mutilated or whether she ran back into the building to save people and was then killed, both of those are important elements of a good propaganda story, quite different propaganda stories, but both of them are important elements of the story. The first one, the idea that she was a nurse and therefore a non-combatant, you know, really a guardian angel on the battlefield helping the wounded and the fact that she was horribly mutilated is part of the story to depict the evil, especially we see this all the time in the First World War, the evil Germans, the the Huns, you know, the barbaric Huns. That, that, so that's an important part of an Allied propaganda story to depict this. You know, she's innocent. She's she's seen as pure on the battlefields, but then she was horribly mutilated by the nasty Germans. Um, but also then the second one, which is probably a little more obvious, is that she was a hero. You know, the, the idea that she ran back into a building and she could have saved herself and didn't. So that's the fact that we don't know, the fact that we don't know exactly what happens to her, happened to her speaks of of the importance of propaganda with these stories after the fact in the, in the late stages of the war. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned the, the German reprisals against civilians when they came back, but also the, the, the terrible fate of the collaborators, the people who, who had gone along, you know, young women who, who for most of their lives had been under German occupation. So it was not surprising that some young women fell in love with German soldiers and had relationships and things. The reprisals the local people carried out on the, on the people they considered traitors and collaborators was just horrific. And again, that's depicted about, you know, in the, in the Holland episode of Band of Brothers that the, um, the cutting of the hair and the, the humiliation of people in the, in the squares. It's just a, you know, a, just a, again, a, 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 an awful aspect of, of occupation and, and warfare. We, uh, it's it's funny when you when you're driving the battlefields and you're exploring the battlefields, you come across very odd little memorials. And I, a few years ago, in the middle of a, a field, so this is actually in northern France, uh, uh, nearer to the coast from where I live, and in the middle of a field, there was a memorial. We could see it. There was no obvious way to get to it. Uh, the, uh, luckily, the crops were not in, and it was it was ploughed, and it was a bit of a muddy old day. And I thought, I'm determined to go and see why this memorial just in the middle of a of a field with no walk. And we, I walked across to it, and it was a memorial memorial to a, a young girl, uh, a 17-year-old girl, who'd been walking back from the German uh, positions, the German barracks were close by, back to her village, almost certainly had a German boyfriend. And when we looked carefully, the memorial had been built by the Germans. So this memorial had been put up to commemorate the loss of a, of a young girl from the local village, who'd been, obviously, I would guess, almost certainly a boyfriend uh, or a girlfriend of one of the, the, the German soldiers. That's why it wasn't looked after, because to the local people, she would have been seen as uh, as a collaborator. Uh, and even though she, she was killed in, in tragic circumstances in a bombing raid, um, it, uh, she, she still was a collaborator. So we went to the local war memorial. She wasn't on the local uh, war memorial from the village that she'd been travelling from. And so a very, very, a very sad little story, really. And I felt like I wanted to look after the memorial to commemorate her and, and just, just, just humanity, really, to commemorate what went on in, in wartime. Um, but because, you know, at some stage, a tractor's going to clonk this thing and, uh, and it's going to be gone and nobody will, will care once it's gone. Uh, so yeah, so just, just little stories that you find as you're, as you're zigzagging across the countryside. And I'd say that, especially throughout this region of Europe, and especially as we're talking about the Second World War, never overlook the the role of civilians and the terrible price paid by civilians throughout this fighting because they were part and parcel of everything that went on, unlike the First World War, where thankfully the majority of civilians were, were cleared from the battlefield area in, in this area. Civilians were just caught up in the fighting at every step of the way. So, um, yeah, we should always just stop and remember them as well. You know, innocent people caught up in terrible fighting. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting point, isn't it, Matt, that, that we should have made earlier, really, I suppose, is up until this point, this this area, there was no damage to it whatsoever because this area had been taken very quickly in, in 1940 when the Germans uh, invaded. Uh, very little fighting took place, so the villages were absolutely intact. Now, most of these the people living in these villages had never seen war, really. They'd been, yes, under German occupation, 
But this right at the end is when they get involved in the war, in the war, in the literal fighting war. But up until that point, this had been a little backwater, just just very close to Germany. And in fact, if you go you know, less than ten miles up the road, the language changes to German. You know, the uh, uh, we're still in Belgium, but they actually speak German. So we're, that's the kind of area that we're in. It's a, a multicultural area: Luxembourgians, uh, Belgians, Germans, French, not far in one direction, and Dutch in the other. So it's uh, yeah, a big. A mishmash of, uh, of of peoples. So we're going to carry on uh, down the road just a little bit further, so it's the, the same road, and we're going to uh, turn a corner and head towards the 101st Airborne Museum. Now, I have to say, I, I didn't know what this museum was going to be like on my very first visit, but I was very impressed with it. It's a small, kind of almost private museum. Um, it's in the former officer's mess of the Belgian army in Bastogne, so this is prior to the, uh, the Second World War. The building wasn't damaged, so it's still, or only damaged lightly, so it's still the same building. Um, but it's an excellent little museum uh, with some uh, lifelike tableaus, and, and the thing that I really enjoyed is going into, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you go into the cellar, into uh, into a, a bomb shelter, and they give you the impression of what it must have been like to be in the cellar by these background noises and rumbling and slight trembling of the uh, of the the benches that you're on that you're sitting on, and it goes dark, and you just get just for a second you get a feeling of what it must have been like to be a civilian or a soldier in the cellars of the town, surrounded by the Germans under bombardment and wondering if you're going to survive and i really enjoyed it so i'd highly recommend 101st airborne museum excellent it's uh, uh, one of the great things about these places isn't it is those small little museums it's it's something that's changing the, the museums as more and more tourists come we've mentioned this in previous podcasts the, the nature of the museums uh, is changing as as government money comes along and they improve them and add toilets and coffee machines and, and make them a better place to visit and they are in terms of the raw facilities they become a much better place to visit but i i lament a little bit the loss of the the private nature of some of these museums the small little museums are always the the, the most the most interesting ones to discover and so i, th- I hopefully they uh, some of these museums stay in place for uh, for years to come I, I really do hope so. In these terrible times that we're in at the moment, uh, it's a worry, isn't it? How many of these little museums, especially the private ones that don't have uh, government money and have had no visitors for and potentially will not have for two years, you know, can they survive? And well, only time will tell when we start to uh, start exploring the battlefields again. Let's hope they're still there. Well said, Pete. Where are we heading to next on the walk? Okay, back up to the main road again. Carry on down the uh, the, the main road, and we're going to a, a little a little small memorial it's a tank turret we've got a tank turret a sherman tank turret again and beside it we've got a a plaque and it's uh, commemorating an american lieutenant ernest glasner um, who was the first american to die in the town so in the in the confines of the town he was killed on this spot on the 10th of september 1944 so this is when they're first moving in when the americans arrive and successfully force the germans out before the german counter-attack and he had destroyed a German tank with his bazooka. So he's an officer, but he grabbed the bazooka, ran into the road, destroyed the German tank, and then sadly uh, was killed just uh, just after. Um, and so his memorial is a turret uh, of a Sherman uh, with a 76 millimeter gun. So one of the ones with a big uh, uh, extended uh, extended gun, capable of knocking out hopefully some of the German tanks, which has always been a problem with tanks. We won't go into a tank talk today, I don't think. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's one of those turrets beside the the road. There are in fact. 11. There are 11 preserved Sherman turrets around the town. I think it's one of those uh, little uh, famous Matt and Pete's tangents we could take, Pete, when we, uh, like when we get talking about uh, pillboxes on the Western Front, we get bogged down talking about different types of concrete. I, I hope that the listeners come with us on that fascinating journey, but the, the same thing could occur when talking about tanks in the Second World War. We won't, uh, dear listeners, we won't subject you to it uh, in, in this podcast, but um, perhaps in the future we'll do a special on uh, on tanks and pillboxes. <laughs> yeah, well, in in... In this case, if you go online, somebody's already done it. There's somebody has, has, has done a little report on every tank turret around Bastogne. So, so it is online somewhere if you, uh, if you rummage online. Well, you and I have talked at various times about doing a website about the various pillboxes that remain on the Western yeah, Front. Yeah, I think that would so, be a great uh, one. Yeah. So, so that will happen at some stage. But, uh, it, you know, I, I think, you know, jokes aside, the importance of these things, tank turrets in Bastogne, pillboxes on the Western Front, the importance is they are tangible connections with the war. And that's what we're trying to do. That's the reason we're trying, the reason we have this podcast, the reason we visit battlefields is we want those connections with history. And you need those tangible things. It's not enough to stand in a field and use your imagination and say, I can understand what it was like when fighting went on here you need tangible connections with history and that's why it's wonderful that these things have been preserved 
Yeah, it is. I, I mean, and important because the days of uh, I used to carry a lot of props with me. So uh, inert grenades, uh, a deactivated rifle, other bits and bobs, always, always handy to have and to bring out at various times. And in fact, in my hand now, I've got the, the jump wings from a, an American uh, paratrooper in front of me. I pick them up and I just I just like having those kind of things around when I'm doing the podcast. But um you know, I think it's important now because we cannot carry those things around with us with ongoing security issues. We're not allowed to carry them anymore. So you need things to be in place that you can take people to and, and go and look at. And thankfully, a lot of these have started to be renovated. I think their worth was not recognised. They were just there. They were put there after the war at some stage, almost forgotten about going rusty, starting to fall to bits. Do we throw them away or do we renovate them? Thankfully, they've realised their importance, especially if you've got this tourist connection. You want people to come to your town and spend uh, the money on your, your Belgian uh, Fritz and uh, etc and so important that, that there are other things to look at and that's what we're doing we are walking around and looking at what has been been preserved so we're going to move on and we're going to basically cut across to another street uh, just as a shortcut cutting through to the Patton monuments Patton obviously he's the American uh, head honcho he's the he's the guy in charge um, and there is a memorial to him. It uh, become apparent in the story. It, uh, he relieved the town uh, when uh, when the, uh, they're relieved, and eventually the German blockade is broken. And so that we have a, a monument to him. It, he's basically a limestone wall with his helmeted face cut into in a bas relief in the in the limestone wall, with with very little to tell you what el- anything else about it, other than that that there he is. Uh, and I just found it odd, really, almost. I can't describe it really. It's just a very strange memorial. There he is, just staring out at you, wearing his helmet uh, and and nothing else. Uh, I don't mean as in naked. It's just his head, but he's um, <laughs> just, uh, just quantify that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just just a, just a, an interesting uh, memorial and uh, and very unusual. I would suggest. I'm in two minds about good old blood and guts pattern because you know his reputation has gone up and down throughout the years the famous movie i think in the 70s depicting him and you know he he certainly has a we look at him through an interesting lens now looking back i'm i've got to say for for his faults i'm i'm more of a fan than i am a, a detractor I, I i think he was a very very good general he was ruthless so there was no question blood and guts was a you know a well earned nickname but he did get things done and and if you study Patton before the Second World War, he was quite a fascinating character. He, for example, was a very dedicated student of warfare when he was training and doing his officer training. And he did, you can look it up online, but he did a fascinating paper assessing Gallipoli as an amphibious landing. And considering the role he would play in the Normandy landings, it's 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 really interesting the the amount of detail he knew about the Gallipoli landing. It's basically a full assessment of, of, of what could have happened differently at Gallipoli, why it worked, why it didn't work. And for an American general to be talking about the Gallipoli landings in 1915 is really quite astonishing. Most Americans would never have heard of Gallipoli. Um, so, you know, I, and it's, it's, he's, at the end of the day, it's a fascinating story of Patton. He was killed right at the end of the war. He's buried, uh, he's buried in Europe, you know, alongside his men. So, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting story. And for all his, for all his detractors, I think, uh, I think he was a very good general at the end of the day and he got some good stuff done uh, during that American advance. Where do you stand on Patton, Pete? Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. The one thing I was just trying to remember is where he's buried. I think he's buried in Luxembourg. I think he's in the big American cemetery in Luxembourg, isn't he? I've, I've, I've been, I, normally when I'm doing this tour, I take people across to uh, to go and see uh, see his grave in Luxembourg. Um, he was killed in a car accident late in the war. He was, yeah, bizarrely. Um, what's what's interesting is that he did a really good job here in the, in relieving the, the pressure or the, solving the Battle of the Bulge, basically. The American Third Army, which were heading up from the south, and they had to literally do a, a, a 90 degrees to 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 it come to the aid of uh, of the, of the the men trapped uh, in the bulge area and um and so uh, amazing 90 degree turn on a 40 kilometer front uh, so he did a really good job in 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 res- resolving this 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 problem so we've paid our respects to the odd face of the naked general pattern and then uh, where to next Okay, so we're going to head now to the... Uh, so we've, we've about face, we've walked back through the square and we're going up the other side of the town now. In fact, we're heading to perhaps uh, 
the most important uh, memorial in the area, the Madison Memorial, which I'll talk about later. But on the way to that, we're going to go past the Town Wall Memorial. Now, always I always stop at the Town Wall Memorials. I cannot help myself. Uh, in this case, it is a war memorial that begins in the First World War, but it's actually created after the Second World War. For the very obvious reason, it was destroyed in the, uh, in the Second World War. And in fact, we've already walked past the church, and you can see a big lump of the original memorial is propped up beside the church of the original First World War Memorial in the town. So this is a modernist memorial, it's uh, quite stark and it's commemorating those that lost their lives from this area in World War I and World War II. Um, always worthwhile uh, 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 to have a look at them. As we've said in previous podcasts, it's fascinating to think of the, I mean I won't labour the point again for the probably the third or fourth time, but it's just fascinating to think of French people. When we see a war memorial in Australia or in England, you know that has, that has a, it talks about a, a strong sacrifice made by people to go off and fight in two world wars. But just the, the, the juxtaposition of the of the situation in France, where you had that same effect. You had peop, young men from the village off fighting in far flung corners in both world wars. But then also you had actually fighting in the town. You had people killed during the fighting in the town. And and I always just wonder what it must have been like, particularly in the First World War, to be a Frenchman from a town in the Somme, for example, a Frenchman who grew up in Tiepval or Pozier, to be thinking while he's off fighting you know, hundreds of kilometres away in the French sector to be thinking what was going on in his town, that, that, that this war was going on in his town. And I think if I was in that position, you know, being from a small country town myself, hello to West Wyalong out in New South Wales, um, if if I was off fighting in some far-flung corner of the battlefield and knew there was fighting going on in West Wyalong, I would want to be back there. I would, if, I would be saying to myself, if I'm fighting in this war, why am I not fighting in my hometown rather than hundreds of kilometres away? So just the the the... the, the just the what the French people had to endure, and indeed all the people of Europe um, during these wars, is just beyond comprehension. I think it is, and of course in the, in the Second World War they had the, the, the secondary issue, I suppose, that uh, the young men who hadn't joined the army, hadn't been conscripted, hadn't got away quick enough and were still at home when the Germans over, overran these areas, then a lot of the young men were then enrolled into various labour groups, uh, sent to Germany or sent to uh, other, other, other areas to build fortifications or to work in factories, uh, and so they disappeared as well. So even even those that were not serving in the military sadly will not see home again until uh, the war has, has finished. So again, it's well worth thinking of those. And very often these memori- these memorials carry an extra plaque, and it's for those that uh, that were taken away and and sadly did not come back. We mentioned uh, in uh, an episode a couple of weeks ago about uh, Hamel in the Somme. We talked about the Australian Battle of nineteen eighteen to capture Hamel, and we we mentioned that we do local. We do services with the local people in Hamel every Anzac Day. One of the ones that I think is always most moving is when the local people commemorate the villagers who were taken away by the Germans during the Second World War and who never returned. And there's always a memorial to those people that were uh, were, were taken away in the early days of the war of the Second World War. This is and uh, and and died in concentration camps or died in labouring for the Germans. So that's always very moving when the local people pay respects to, you know, to their family members, their, their, their distant relatives who were, were deported. That's what they call it, the deportation memorial by the Germans never to return. So just, uh, again, you're right, Pete, we should always stop and look at the French memorials because firstly, they're fascinating. They, they, they always tell an interesting story. But to just think about the depth of suffering that they that they represent. Well, again, interestingly, I'll talk about just a, a recent experience uh, this this week. Actually, um, I was out on one of my my recce's, going to have a look at some of the villages behind the lines, and what I was actually looking for, I was literally looking for. Uh, the graves of those killed in bombing raids. So these are French uh, civilians killed in bombing raids. So I was looking in the civil cemeteries just to see, uh, uh, get an idea of, of the the numbers of people who may be in the civil cemetery and uh, and the war memorials, the, the civilian war memorials. So not going to the Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries, which I normally do. It was totally looking in the the civil cemeteries uh, behind the lines here to have a look at, at what was going on uh, uh, and get and get a, a feel of what was happening in these little villages in northern France. Where to next on our stroll, Pete? Okay, so we're going to go to a, a very odd little memorial. It's a, just a wooden cross that has the names, they look like identity discs of uh, 13 soldiers uh, fastened onto this cross, and it's on a wall in a, a little bit of a, a ruined building. Well, it's it's, it's a, a building that, that looks like it's ruined and has then been uh, turned into a little garden area. And it's commemorating uh, 13 American soldiers who, who were sadly killed after the fighting has, has left this area, were killed when they were loading landmines onto 
a lorry. And one of the landmines detonated and set the whole lot off and it killed everybody that was in that area. Uh, and it was uh, beside a, a regimental aid post, so uh, which was a, a chapel, and that's where they're now commemor uh, commemorated. And that was uh, actually created by a local a local chap in 1992 so again it, it adds another extra interest i suppose that we have to think about is that there are an awful lot of local people who are interested in the great in the in the war in the second world war interested in what went on in the area and sometimes feel that something's missing that there should have been a, a memorial to commemorate this 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 terrible accident uh, and uh, and in this case uh, a chap called andre Sen, I presume you pronounce his name again. We're back to my pronunciation of French and Belgian names. Um, and uh, he's had this little memorial put up and well worth just making the effort to walk up the street and go and uh, have a look to it, a look at it. So then we're heading onwards and we're still walking towards the Madison Memorial, which is just outside of the town. Uh, you, you're going to get great views from it looking back into the town and we're going to come to another preserved German tank turret. Uh, this one... Uh, is uh, has no explanatory uh, information on it but it's well worth having a look at because you can see exactly why this tank was knocked out because there's a, a hole that goes right through the turret where you can see where a round actually uh, entered the turret um, so it's worthwhile going to have a look at and beside it there's another odd memorial and it's to the, the nurses of Bastogne so that's what it's called the nurses of Bastogne memorial to my mind it looks like it's unfinished and I put in my notes here also odd unfinished um but it's uh, that's what it's for. It's a memorial commemorating the nurses that served during during the siege, and all of these would be in the main civilian nurses who were who were in the area. So again, worthwhile uh, having a look at. Then we're going to walk up the hill, and you start to see the memorial, um, the Madison Memorial. But what we're going to do before we get there, we're going to go into another museum, and this is the Bastogne War Museum. Now this is unmissable. It, it is a fantastic museum, probably one of the best that I've been to on the battlefields. I really enjoy this museum. It's one where you're guided. So you, you are actually guided as you're going around. As part of it is you can listen uh, to your headsets and other times people will come and talk about certain aspects that you'll... It's a, just a wonderful museum. Great uh, bookshop. It's got toilets. Always have to look for toilets on these tours. Um, and a cafe, so you can get, you can also get a, a cup of coffee or, or tea if you need if you need to as well, or something to eat. Actually, uh, you can eat there as well. Uh, so well worth uh, going to have a look at. It's all singing, all dancing. This one, it's got uh, uh, audio audio links. It's got uh, depictions of what was going on. You even sit in the theatre and you get the feel of the of the men walking through the woods. So it's great. I highly recommend it. Pete, you mentioned. Um... When you mentioned that the the tank turret with the with the hole in it, uh, just a, a previous stop, something that just struck me there is that um, it's funny the interesting little things you discover about warfare that perhaps Hollywood has influenced our our thoughts about how wars are fought and how battles take place. But it's worth noting that that uh, you know when a tank is knocked out, as we as we said, when a tank is destroyed during fighting, it can be the case that there's a big explosion and the turret gets blown off and the tank gets absolutely shattered. But very often, surprisingly often, you will see. A knocked out tank which has virtually no damage on it except for one little hole and the reason is is these are high velocity armor piercing rounds that successfully penetrate the armor and it and the reason the tank is knocked out is that round goes into the tank but then generally doesn't come out again and just effectively disintegrates and bounces around on the inside which obviously has a pretty poor effect for the inside of the tank and the poor crew in there as well so you'll see that so many times you'll see a picture of a knocked out tank which just will have one round little hole in it only a couple of inches across which is where a high-velocity round pierced the tank and um, absolutely wreaked havoc on the inside. So again, I mean, it must be one of the most horrific horrific aspects of fighting and warfare, but just being um, trapped in a tank with all yeah. this going on around you must be just truly terrible. Well, I think in a previous podcast, we talked about what it was like fighting inside a blockhouse or a bunker um and uh, and i think a tank is almost as bad it's uh yeah it's really it's a moving pillbox isn't it that's what it's designed to be it's what's designed to be on the battlefield it's a it's a it's a it's a pillbox in motion and the same just that nature being trapped it's bad enough to be talk about wounds and death and the, the horrors of being in a war but to to combine that with the claustrophobia and the, the nature of being trapped it's just it's beyond it's beyond awful I have to say, at 16, I nearly joined the, the uh, Royal Armoured Corps. I'd signed up as a junior leader in the Royal Armoured Corps, and then I chickened out and joined the commandos instead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not too many people that ever express, I chickened out and joined the commandos instead. That, for listeners, yeah. there's a great statement right there. That sums up Pete Smith <laughs> in uh, one, easy, one easy sentence. Another interesting memorial, Pete, that we're coming to now. Okay, so this is a very small memorial, and it's again, it's a, a fairly recent memorial, 2008. 
And it's just uh, an eagle uh, looking down onto a, an upturned American helmet and it's commemorating the 101st Airborne Division. Now, this is in between uh, the Bastogne War Museum and the uh, Madison Memorial. Let's talk for a minute about Easy Company, 101st Airborne. Everyone knows them from Band of Brothers. And look, I'm as big a fan as anyone. It's, it's, it's a fantastic story. But I do think what we should also add at this point is they were not superhuman heroes who won the war. They were simply representative and because of the book that came out and then eventually the miniseries, that company became the focus of so much attention. But we should remember that they were one of you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies that were fighting uh, in this area, in all these great actions. And, and we should never... I know the Airborne is very, very sexy. It is an amazing concept, the idea that guys were jumping out of planes to go and fight and you know surrounded at Bastogne and all these things we know about them. It's, it's a brilliant story. But let's not forget the blokes in the army who did the majority of the heavy lifting, the guys in the tanks, the Air Force... The, you know, the guys behind the lines, the guys refueling tanks and cars and carrying supplies and working on ships, sailors bringing supplies across. The, the, the one thing we should always remember when we talk about particularly the world wars is collaboration. This was a combined effort of nations to win the war and, and all parts of the huge machine that makes up a military force. So I think it's important that we remember the 101st, we remember Easy Company. Great story. Read the book, watch the miniseries, remember them, but also remember everyone else that was the hundreds of thousands, the millions of other people that were fighting in the area at the same time. I think what's great about the the miniseries was that it was it, it just felt realistic, and it's in in a time when uh, uh, CGI uh, computer generated imagery was still not brilliant, but it uh, it still. I don't know. There was something about it that was clever, and I think it was also that they brought in some of the original uh, uh, members of the company, and they would do their little spiel at the beginning or at the end of each of each episode, and it just gave you that connection to them to such an extent that you can now go on a an easy company tour from literally from the coast to to Berlin. Uh, it's just just extraordinary how 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 it's taken off and grabbed people's imagination to the extent where people now will go and see the, the actors that played in it have become almost as as important as the, as, as the as the people that originally fought most of whom sadly now have have have, uh, have, have left us uh, so it's yeah so it's an interesting concept but but it is a, a great series if you haven't seen it then I would hi- highly recommend it and very often I refer to it even when I'm guiding on the first world war battlefields because there are certain scenes uh, during the film and we're going to come back to it right at the end of this podcast uh, and uh, certain scenes that that are reminiscent of, of first world war fighting as well so onwards just up the hill uh, past the 101st airborne Div- uh, divisional memorial to a very unusual and yet spectacular memorial uh, called the madison memorial and i have to say i had no idea until i was doing a bit of research for this podcast why it was called the madison memorial i just never really thought it through and it's purely the name of the hill. It's it's built on uh, Madison Hill, uh, so that that's uh, that's why it's uh, it's called the Madison Memorial. Um, it is in fact the American Memorial to the Battle of the Bulge. That's what it, what it is, and it's a, a huge five pointed American star. It's uh, twelve meters high, so you can it's very high. You can go on top of it, so you can actually walk onto the top of the walls. Uh, it, was, it was designed by a Belgian architect. So this is the, these are the Belgians commemorating the American efforts in uh, in this area. So it's not an American memorial. Now, that's not quite true now because it is at the moment. It's just been uh, signed over to the American Monuments Commission on a 10-year lease. They are now looking after it. So they are going to monitor it. They will be, they normally have staff there that will uh, will help you find your way around. Um, I haven't been since this happened. It's just, just recent that this has happened. It's been handed over to the, uh, the American Monuments Commission. I suspect it also needs a bit of a, a refit, and they're paying for it. I would, I would guess. So, a ninety-nine year lease started in twenty twenty. So, literally, just I haven't been back to the battlefield because of uh, COVID. So, it's uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what they what are they are going to do. It lists all of the American states on this memorial. Uh, it also lists battle <laughs> battle honors. So the, the the walls are just fantastic. Forty eight uh, American states at that time. It's changed. I think it's fifty now. But forty eight states. There's a section on this uh, on this enormous twelve uh, twelve meter high uh, star for each state, and then we have the unit badges uh, emblazoned on it as well, which is quite interesting if you're in- interested in color patches of American units. You can spend a lot of time uh, looking at them. Um, Who it, isn't? Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
Uh, it commemorates the 76,890 American casualties of the bulge. Now, be aware, casualties, again, is the figure, so that's uh, not, not just the dead, it's also the, the wounded and the missing, etc. Um, inaugurated on the 4th of July, or perhaps what I should say, that the first sod was turned uh, on the 4th of July, 1946, inaugurated on the 16th of July, 1950. And it, it was, and still is, I suppose, a Belgian uh, state-owned site. Um, and as I say, now looked after by the American Battle Monuments uh, Commission for 99 uh, years. So, as I said, you can walk to the top and uh, we have uh, access uh, up a little stairway to the top and it is definitely worthwhile going up there. There are also uh, directional uh, pointers telling you which direction you're looking at. You can look down uh, into the, the town. I think one of the points I haven't made is is this is a very, very mountainous countryside. So so we're high already and this extra height gives us uh, just, just fan, uh, fantastic uh, uh, views. If we walk down again to the centre of this this star, we have, uh, I suppose it's uh, a, a, like an altar, I suppose, uh, and on it it's a big stone, and on it it says, the Belgian people remember their American liberators, 4th of July 1946. So again, as we know, this, this, uh, this is a, a Belgian memorial to the Americans. Now, one of the things that most people do not bother to go and look at and you must is to walk off the memorial walk round to the front of it the side that's facing the town so you're looking down to Bastogne and there is a crypt beneath it and it's known as the memorial crypt it has the most beautiful uh, um, uh, altars with behind mosaics just fantastic mosaics uh, it's recognized as, as a uh, as I suppose a, a national piece of art uh, in Belgium and uh, it's certainly well worth going not particularly well signposted you need to just make the effort to go there the three altars one for the Protestants one for the Catholics and one for the the Jews so it's it's just a beautiful crypt underneath it really does feel like there should be in the middle of it there should be a kind of an unknown soldier or something there and and that's the really I suppose the feel it was supposed to give it was a place for people to go and to contemplate people that had lost relatives they could go down there all denominational and and, and contemplate so yeah it's uh it, it, it's it's well worth the effort make sure you go around uh, and beneath the memorial to go and have a look at it one of the things I want to touch on there, Pete, that you mentioned, which we said this was a costly battle for the Americans, but how cost 76,890 casualties in the Battle of the Bulge. That's a big old battle. I mean, when we talk about casualties, that is a lot of people killed and wounded in one, in one action, albeit it went for a long time, but that is a huge number of casualties. Yeah, it, it is indeed. Um, and uh, I'm just going to look at the German casualties. German casualties are disputed, but they may have been as high as 120,000 men killed or wounded. Uh, and about 700 tanks destroyed. So as as we talked right at the beginning of this podcast, this was really the end of, of the German army, you know, to, to lose 700 tanks. And, and an awful lot of those tanks had to be abandoned, not necessarily destroyed in the way that we would, would imagine. They were abandoned because they ran out of fuel, they ran out of petrol. Most of the German tanks were running on petrol, not diesel, and they ran out and they just had to walk away from them. So it was the end. The, the German army now is walking back into Germany. Well, Peter, it's been a fascinating walk around the town of Bastogne. Anything else you want to uh, show us before we finish I'm up? I'm just going to talk about one site that I've not been to. Every time I've been on tour here or visited or, or, or on a recce to have a look at the place uh, is the Bastogne Barracks Museum, which is right in the centre of, uh, of the town. Um, and um, oh, it's actually it's towards the edge of the town, but it's uh, it feels like it's in in, in the middle of the town. Uh, and it was where the headquarters of the 101st Airborne Division actually were were placed within these barracks. And it has an awful lot of hands-on tanks and equipment and things you can go and have a look at and actually and actually touch. Um, I can't tell you much more about it because, as I say, every time I've been, I have not been. And then just one, two more things really that I need to point out that you have to, if you're coming here and you're making the effort to go to Bastogne, then these are part of it. One of them is called uh, Jack's Wood and it's uh, where Easy Company were. And I had the lucky situation of going there in the winter in the snow and actually the foxholes have been redug or they've been enhanced. In other words, they've filled in slowly, but they've, they've dug them again. And it's the, the foxholes that the Easy Company held uh, looking down onto a village called Foy. Uh, and uh, 
if you watch the episode in the Band of Brothers series, you'll know exactly why people go there. It is a very popular place to go. I try and go there, as we've mentioned in other podcasts. Go there in the evening when it's getting dark or early in the morning so you avoid anybody else being there because it is spectacular. And a few years ago, I hit it when it was full of snow, just exactly the same temperatures as when they were there when it was uh, uh, very snowy. So well worth going to have a look at. And then to go with it, go then, and it's not far from this point, go to the German cemetery. There is a German uh, war graves uh, cemetery here at a place called, now again, Recoin, I think it's how you pronounce it, close to Foy. And that is well worth going to have a look at. Uh, always very moving to go and look at the German uh, cemeteries. Um, 6,800 German soldiers uh, are buried there. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, a lovely little chapel there, and the walls around this and the graves. You can again, you can spend an hour or two just wandering amongst the graves there. We should always make that point. We implore you to go to the German cemeteries as well when you are on these battlefields. I mean, go to any military cemetery is always fascinating, but we should remember, especially after you know we're getting you know, we're on eighty years now since the Second World War, and we can put all the horrors of Nazism and the Holocaust aside in some respects to remember the poor blokes who had to go through this. And the reality is if you're a poor bloke from Dresden or Strasbourg or, you know, wherever you were from and, you know, fighting, you know, you you went through the same hardships as the blokes on the Allied side. And regardless of the ideology, it's, it's just worth remembering at the end of the day, the reason we visit these battlefields is to remember individuals who did extraordinary things. And it's worth going to the German cemeteries and remembering that these are sons and husbands and fathers as well. This one's a little bit special uh, as well. I, I should have mentioned um, it actually was at one stage alongside the American cemetery for the area. That American cemetery was closed down and they were moved. Uh, so there were two thousand five hundred American soldiers buried alongside the Germans here. And I think it's a little sad that they're not still here. I think it would be a nice juxtaposition to see them side by side. But it was decided that uh, too few soldiers were going to be in the in the cemetery and. The, uh, the Americans, generally speaking, centralised their burials. Most of the guys from this area uh, went to uh, uh, into Luxembourg, to the big American cemetery in Luxembourg. Um, so there's nobody here now. There is a little memorial commemorating that there used to be an American cemetery alongside the German cemetery. Well, Pete, as always, it's been a fascinating walk. I've really enjoyed this one, not actually having walked the ground. I know a lot about this battle. I've read a lot about it and, and spoken to a couple of veterans too, which was fantastic. But I've never actually walked the ground and I certainly will. And this has made me <laughs> determined that as soon as I can get back there. I tell you what, the trip, the first trip I do to the battlefields is going to be about six months long. I've got so much to, to see and do when I get over there. But a highlight of that, mate, is going to be walking with you across the across some of these famous grounds because it's just such a treat. So thank you very much for sharing your knowledge on uh, on this very important site. It's a pleasure, Matt. It's been very enjoyable. 